Uh, hi everyone, we are starting the session. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Leila Zia. I'm head of research at the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, and I'm here to talk with you today about 10 research findings and how you can use them at, in your work. Um, the sound that you heard, many of you know, some of you may not. Um, it's the sound of Wikipedia. Listen to Wikipedia. It's on hatnote, listen com. Listen hatnote.com. Thank you. Um, and you just saw the edits that were happening in Wikipedia and Wikidata um, and the sound associated with them. Um, uh, I'm just going to very briefly talk about the research team at the Wikimedia Foundation. Our mission is to develop models and insights using scientific methods um, and to strengthen the Wikimedia research communities. We do this work for two primary impact uh, purposes. One is to support the technology and policy needs of the Wikimedia projects. And when I say policy, it's really uh, a broad term. It can be the, you know, the guidelines that you all develop on the projects or any policies that you develop. Um, or to advance the understanding of the Wikimedia projects. So we see part of our job um, as a research team to do research that can help advance the understanding of Wikimedia projects. Um, uh, if you want to learn more about the team, the people who are in the team, I encourage you to go to research.wikimedia.org and learn about them. Um, and one more note, everything that I present to you today is the work of the team. I had uh, nothing to do with the work, but I have the privilege of presenting it. Members of the team may be joining uh, remotely um, and they may uh, welcome them to engage uh, in the conversations. Um, just a bit of uh, format for this session. Uh, I'm going to share with you some findings on uh, three different areas, contributors and readers, content and models. And when I finish each part, uh, I'm just going to pause and we're going to have a conversation with one another. Some of you know the work that we do, the work behind the scenes can get uh, quite detailed and technical. This is not a session where I unpack what's happening behind the scenes. There are different sessions and you know, different purposes um, that we, where we cover that kind of thing. So here I'm mostly focusing on what are the things that we learned and then having a conversation about how you can use it in your work. When we get to the discussion, I may start the dis discussion with a couple of ideas that we may have. But I'm mostly going to be looking at you all, leaving you with the data, and just uh, asking you to ponder on what, how do you think you can use this data or the, the knowledge on the work that you do. And we do some share outs together. Um, so let's, uh, with that, let's just go to the first part. Um, it's um, contributors and readers. These are you know, uh, many of you who are in this room, the humans behind the Wikimedia projects. And I'm going to talk very briefly about those who could be the humans behind the Wikimedia projects, but they're not directly on the projects today as well. Um, how we learned um, the things that you're going to see in one slide after, uh, what we did over the past 12 months is that we learned about uh, contributors by um, conducting surveys and also doing interviews. Um, contributors is broadly defined. Um, editors, admins, organizers, um, and some of the other groups on the projects. We learned about readers by conducting surveys, interviews, and on top of that, in the case of readers, we have access to web request logs. These are the logs each time you request a page on the Wikimedia projects. Uh, we basically receive a hit. Um, on average, we receive 160,000 requests per second. So there is a lot of data that is coming in about people who are accessing people and machines that are accessing uh, Wikimedia projects, and we have access to that, and we also analyze that. Um, the contributor survey, or some of you know it, community insights. If you have participated in it, thank you so much for doing that. You're going to see the part of the fruit of your labor in this presentation. Uh, we ran that in 29 languages, and more than 3,000 contributors participated in that. The reader survey, uh, we ran it in 23 Wikipedia languages. Um, more than 400,000 people started the survey and 80,000 people finished the survey. So we have complete responses from them. 
Um, and there's the archetype survey. Uh, these are um, this is a new project. Some of you may have uh, attended another talk by Rita two days ago where she presented on archetypes. I'm not going to go through the details of it. But we are trying to understand who are the people who are outside of the Wikimedia projects who may want to join us on the Wikimedia projects. So we're trying to learn their motivations and uh, what they're doing. That survey was run in English only. It's the first survey we're running in this space. And around 1,400 people participated in it. So what did we learn as a result of these things that we did? Um, uh, we learned that active editors are, are pro, um, pro, proportionately young. And when I say that, I mean that if you look at the distribution of the age of um, uh, the population in the world, what we see that is that our active editor um, is around 21% or uh, between 18 and 24 year olds. And that actually matches very closely um, the rest of the distribution as well, the distribution of the global distribution of uh, age in the, in the world, considering all countries. Um, they are disproportionately men. Uh, we have 80% uh, of our active editors men. Um, and they are highly motivated, and many of you are highly motivated, by altruism, learning, and accuracy. Um, these motivation points, if editors uh, voted more than 90% um, to these reasons for being motivated to contribute to the Wikimedia projects. Admins um, are even more, unfortunately, disproportionately um, uh, gendered. 93% uh, of our admins uh, report to be men. Uh, organizers are 66% um, women or minorities, other minor gender minorities. And our newcomers are 76% um, uh, women. Um, did I say it correctly? No, sorry, men. Men, sorry. Yes, yes. Um, so this is still significantly more than what we see later on, of course, on the project. So this is um, the notion of pipeline of contribution. Aaron Shaw and others have covered this in the past, but basically the idea is that the more we put steps in front of people, the more we basically start losing people, and it can disproportionately affect minorities, in this case, women. Um, there are pre preliminary results from the archetype research, and it looks like what motivates the Wikimedia editors um, can be different than what motivates people who are contributing to other parts of the knowledge commons. It's something to keep in mind. It can mean many things. We can do a lot of things with this information. Um, our readers are young. Um, roughly 50% of our readers are less than 30 years old. Um, they are highly educated, 77% uh, beyond high school, and disproportionately men. Uh, roughly 66% are men. Many of our readers um, come to the website only for one session. 73% uh, of the time, readers come, they open a page, and they read something, and they leave. Um, just one note I have to say that, you know, this, um, the rest of the 27% is a very large number. We basically have millions and millions of readers who are coming for more than one uh, hop on the site. But that's uh, definitely a lot of people come only once for one session, one hop in a session, basically checking one page. Um, and when they come for longer than checking one page, they usually browse relatively fast between the pages. So they spend some, somewhere around 74 seconds um, on the pages. Um, they heavily use external search engines. This is something that many of us know already, and the results shows that this still seems to be the case. And um, perhaps important for many of you, they abandon their sessions when they face low quality articles. They leave the site, they may come back, they have different motivations for reading Wikipedia at different times of the day, and their topic preferences also changes during the day. Again, this is something that you may expect from your own experience, but it's also something that the data shows. Um, this, these are the, some of the findings I wanted to share with you on the contributors and readers front, and this is basically the end of this portion. I want to pause here and just open the room for any reflections that you have as you look at this data, any surprises that you have, or anything that you think by looking at this data, you may want to do something about it. And let me give you the mic. Thank you. I have a quick question about the one session thing. I'm confused. Does that mean that uh, 
people are coming for one page and then never returning, or they may return later and start a new session? Um, they may return later, but they return later late enough that is not counted as part of the session. Um, I'm curious about number one, active editors, where you kind of basically squish everyone together because the the globe, the distribution of young people in the, in the world is obviously skewed towards um, certain continents and 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 just trying to ask basically if you unpack them, do you see proportionate populations you know, per region? Um, so this data is relatively fresh. We are still analyzing it. Um, uh, so for some countries, some languages, we will be able to give breakdown. We are working with the privacy team to see how we can do that. And when that's available on Meta, I can answer that question. Martin and then. So most of the numbers look like what I would expect, but beyond high school seems very high number. Do you have an idea what's causing it? Is it maybe the data is skewed because people who have a high education will feel, are more likely to fill out a survey, something like that? Um, I'll talk about it a little bit later, so I, we don't know for sure. Uh, but one thing that I'll share later is that the content is actually designed for much higher levels of education, and that may, there may be at least correlation there, um, but definitely not causality. But I'll talk about it a little bit later. We can come back to it. <coughs> yeah, what, what surprises me is the data about young people, uh, because you know th th there was that survey from future audiences that saw that young people are more and more um, discouraged from uh, trusting Wiki Wikipedia as their first so source. They prefer something which is more interactive. More. So it's good to see that young people are still among editors because there is a lot of talking about generational gap and this kind of problem. So Right. Uh, and one thing I should clarify is that what you see here is, of course, the global numbers, right? And for many of you, you, you should care about the global numbers, but you also will care about like your regional or language numbers. So that's something to keep in mind that, you know, when people share data, if it's specific about a certain country or certain region, that can be very different. So we know, for example, some country, in some countries in the world, the population is aging. And I have not looked at the breakdown, but if in those countries it also follows the distribution, it means in those countries, for example, we have much fewer young, much fewer younger people, right? You're a good leader. Yeah. Only a short question: How did you define low-quality articles? Um, we have a quality score uh, model. Um, this is if you want to check the model cards for it. It's um, on Meta. If you just look for model cards, um, any of these models have like e explanation, detailed explanation there. But we basically have a model that predicts um, the quality of the article per language based on using the current articles that are already labeled by um, editors as high quality or like different levels of quality. And then we have a model that for the ones that are not labeled predicts what should be the quality of that article. So based on that, we can say, okay, if the prediction is accurate, um, this article was low quality and the reader left. Um, I want to um, take maybe one more from Nemo, and then I want to say if there are any fine, any kind of reflections on what you may want to do with the data, maybe take one or, one or two points, and then we can switch to the next section. So just to follow up on what you just said, uh, are you able to differentiate the, um, this kind of predictive um, evaluation whether the the for example the banners are scaring off the the, the readers t stating and a uh, lack of quality which may or may not be true um, so I don't know when this study was run if there were banners or not I can take this as a question and come back to you like I understand I understand yes I know uh-huh you mean the templates on the pages let me just take this as a question and then get back to you. Um, okay, we have, um, can someone give the mic back there? Let's take uh, one and two and then uh, we go to the next. So I'm uh, Natasha from uh, Les Sans Pages, uh, tackling gender gap on the French Wikipedia. So I came here to see what I could take away to uh, 
impact on uh, our own project. And I had already read the reports, but uh, I think that uh, the projects working on the gender gap need to focus more on having uh, editors, women editors and minorities stay on Wikipedia, whereas we are focused on organizing events and we have a lot of women organizers who face burnout when I think that we should really bring them, take their place on the projects and on the governance of the project, which is reflected by the fact that we have few women admins and we face, uh, so that would be my takeaway from the results and what I would effectively do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. And I will say this is an important gap that we continue to have amidst many trials. And I think I want to just encourage us all to contribute in the ways that we can to support the community who's really trying to change the dynamics of gender representation on the projects to be able to do that. Because it seems like we all can do more to help our community to change this dynamic. This 80%, um, I'm not um, showing the data from the previous years, but basically the data stays the same. On the actually changing the active editor gender distribution, we're not doing well. If you look at the content, we do much better. The content um, distribution is changing, but the, for the editors themselves, we are not doing very well. Okay, I have a question. Uh, let's take one more and then move on, yeah. Okay, um, so my question is based on this language models that are evolving these days. Earlier, what you used to see is when people search for something in the search engine and uh, Wikipedia comes into the picture. So that kind of helped us uh, uh, building the number of readership and everything. Now, when people are using the directly chat GPT or other AI models, does that impact in terms of readership for Wikipedia projects? Because information that are available on the language models, those comes by the different technologies, which Wikipedia projects doesn't use. Yeah. So, so um, studying exactly where the reader is before they come to the Wikimedia projects requires cross-platform exactly. collaboration, which is not just about the collaboration. We need to also figure out the privacy components of it because we're not going to share certain types of data with another platform, and other platforms have also concerns about share, sharing user data with us. But basically, actually doing the study properly, like um, to understand what is the effect of potential banners on their end, will need some sort of either browser extension or collaboration between platforms. However, we're monitoring the data generally right now, and the general trend has not, like currently we are not seeing major drops that we can associate with the changes. But this is not a space that we can sit comfortably, right? We need to con continue looking at because that space is very dynamic. Okay, uh, so let's move. Uh, I'm gonna leave you all with these. I hope that you, know, you use it for the rest of your day and tonight in the party, we can talk more about it. Um, these are some of the resources, the research uh, pages that you can go and learn about these projects. They're in the slides. Uh, just going to keep it up. A couple of photos. Okay. Uh, so now let's talk about content. Uh, so how we learned the stuff that I'm going to share with you in the previous slide, in the next slide. Um, what I'm going to share is based on two um, general studies. One is, is we developed a BERT uh, multilingual readability model for Wikipedia articles in 104 languages. Um, so we basically have a model that can say how readable is an article uh, in Wikipedia. And then we did an extensive analysis of the state of articles uh, in these languages um, to better understand the state of readability. We care about this because we think readers are basically not getting the kind of information that they're looking for on the projects. And from a project perspective, this is a concern because if they don't get it here, they may go somewhere else. So we want the readers to come to the sites as much as possible because we think that you know this encyclopedic environment that we're contributing to is the place that we want many of the readers to get the information from. Uh, we additionally studied orphan articles. Uh, for those of you who may not know what are orphan articles, these are articles that are not linked to from any other article. Um, um, in all of the Wikipedia languages, we studied these articles. Um, and we have a few findings uh, to share on this front. Uh, 
Uh, one is that the majority of content in Wikipedia is too difficult to read. For an adult with an average read, uh, read, reading ability, uh, I'll give an example from the US and the case of English Wikipedia, but this holds for many of the languages and countries. Um, in English Wikipedia, almost 60% of the articles are written for those with higher levels of education than what an average United States person can read. And this is like something to ponder on as we are writing content, uh, or maybe there are other things that we can draw from here. Every month, uh, roughly 200,000 new articles get created on Wikipedia across all the languages. And there are almost 9 million articles currently that are orphans. Um, this is around 15% of uh, the content that is effectively the articles that are not connected, they don't have incoming links from other articles. Um, the sad part, the very sad part, is that these orphan articles are effectively invisible to the millions of readers who are trying to use the navigation on Wikipedia, hyperlinks or otherwise, to get to these articles. So this um, structural bias particularly affects biographies of women. Um, they are overrepresented among the orphan articles. Um, and this is important to know because if you're creating an article about a, uh, about a woman and you're not linking to that article, then you're doing amazing work, but you could do one more step. And this article, um, we now know that we have causal evidence that if you actually add the incoming link um, and de-orphanize this article, we will see statistically significant and persistent increase in page views to this article. So if you're creating an article, all I can say, just please link to it somehow. Make sure people can reach it. These are the two learnings I wanted to share here. I'm going to pause for any reflections, reactions, questions, things that you think you may want to do with this. Um, let's start. Thank you. Um, I've also heard talk about orphan articles in another kind of from another point of view, where we actually call them that when they have been deserted. So either their author is not present on the platform anymore, or has died, or has been excluded. So wouldn't it be an idea to also label the deserted articles in some kind of way, so that people can actually help them because their quality is often very weak. And if an article hasn't been worked on for like 10 years or more, then it usually doesn't really add much to the project. So we haven't studied this, right? But I'll just react to your question, which is I, I think it is a very reasonable suggestion to say, to me it sounds very reasonable to say, we want to know if an article is abandoned and nobody is maintaining it. There are risks uh, even for that situation, right? So yes, it makes sense. Uh, and. I think experimentation on that front with the communities would be great. Uh, Ross, and then uh, I'm really interested in the readability results, and especially because that captures an aspect of what I think of as article quality um, that is actually not part of the, the article quality model. And so I was wondering if you knew anything about how the BERT readability correlates with um, the, the quality models and, and whether we could improve our quality models by adding a readability component. <laughs> well, I was a little bit in the same direction. I got surprised but that uh, and I'm thinking that that's a really important information you're giving to us, mostly for the ones who are worried about fighting against this information. So I feel there is a connection of how can people proceed, uh, process information if they find so difficult the Wikipedia articles, and that we usually say that Wikipedia uh, should raise its level of information, and now it seems like, wow, uh, what, what does it mean to to do that if it's right now being thought as too difficult to be read. Like it came out with a question to think about it. 
Oh, mm, I'll come back uh, to you, Ryan. Just uh, a minute. I'm going to move to here uh, because I want to... Um, there's a tool you can t start testing at least on your own until I get back to you with an answer. Um, uh, readability on ToolForge. You can start testing with some of the articles that you may have in mind and you may get the answer to the questions. But I have the question and I'll come back to you. Ryan, do you have a mic? Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so looking at the uh, the orphan statistics was really interesting. And uh, so biographies of women are something that we do a lot of outreach about. And so this suggests to me that de-orphaning is not currently part of the system that we typically use during outreach events where people create a bio and then we kind of leave it there. Um, so my question is about that last bullet point where we see an increase in the internally referred page views. So if we're going to prioritize the very limited and valuable time that we have with new editors who are learning to create, I'm trying to get a sense of um, what's, what percentage of page views are internally referred so that we can try to say, is this a better use of time to like create an hour at the end of our edit-a-thon to de-orphan? Yeah. Uh, I I can roughly answer that. I don't have the separation between search and internal search and um, hyperlink navigation, but it's roughly around 30%. But it's 30, this is significant, right? You have basically millions of readers that are trying to, millions of, millions of readers reading sessions or attempts that are trying to navigate that network. Um, and it seems to be a relative, like, uh, pardon my ignorance, but it seems to be a relatively simple step to add just to say, make sure there's an incoming link. Um, let's take maybe two more and then we move on. So we have an automated list of orphaned articles. Yeah? So, and we actually, um, before last Christmas, we had a special action and uh, for one, there was also a day where, uh, where the people were encouraged just to find a match for an orphaned article of their choice. Thank you so much. And Claudia, I'm thinking about your talk the other day about, uh, was it Wiki Martisor? And I'm thinking like, even if somebody doesn't want to write an article, just the orphanize an article of a woman. Okay, um, let me give chance, uh, Martin, we'll come back to you later. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you very much for the discussion and uh, for letting me uh, ask the question as well. So uh, you mentioned that the majority, the vast majority of the articles are intended, let's say, for people with higher levels of education. Um, a partial solution to that would be the simple English Wikipedia, which is, well, uh, simple English. So that's the only exception, I think, that does not have a, a separate uh, ISO code. Uh, would it be a vi viable idea to create a, either um, separate subdomains for these simple projects, like simple German, simple French, whatever, um, or uh, parts of these projects intended for uh, p people with lower levels of education or for, for people with uh, you know, low, low, lower uh, um, capa uh, well, capacity or capability for processing the information, uh, given that the initiative with Leichte Sprache in, Ger in Germany was not over, uh, uh, overly accepted. Like, uh, uh, there are some places where it was accepted and it's still used. Uh, but however, I think in Bavaria, they uh, actually tur turned it down. So the, the, the uh, regional government uh, stopped using Leichte Sprache at some point. So. Thanks for thinking through it and thinking about in which ways we can approach to change this. Um, I think what I want to encourage is different ways of thinking about this problem and there may be different solutions that we come up with. So for example, looking at um, this information around readability, maybe we should consider how we're going to use artificial intelligence to have different versions of the article available for uh, people. right? So People have, like, not everybody wants to read the article very simple. Maybe some people want to read it more complicated. Some people have more background. The other thing I want to say is that we need to think about what kind of impact, I, not we need to, but I want to encourage you to think about what kind of impact these articles have. So, for example, if the article is about um, um, 
treatment, access to health, maybe we want to consider to simplify it further or have a more simplified version available in some way. I think it is mm, maybe, mm, I, I bring these as examples of things to think about and not as, of course, like prescriptions. But I think what I'm hoping that this shows and encourages is different ways of thinking about how to address this problem. And I trust in the power of you all as the community that you're going to go back to your communities and do the thing that works best for your community. Is it quick? Um, maybe consider um, that tool, Readability. I, I tried it out. It's nice. Um, maybe to work against sections, because just as you said, um, like disease articles should be maybe scientifically oriented, but then the treatment section maybe should be uh, more readable. So um, that sort of granular granularity uh, helps. Thank you so much for that. Okay, let's move on to the last section, AI models. I think no session uh, can be completed, at least when the research team is present without this. Um, so what are some of our key learnings and um, advancements? Um, I think I wanna really focus on some of the learnings and some of the questions we're struggling with right now, and I wanna share those with you, and hopefully you know, we're gonna have conversations that's gonna help us and help you all with the work that you do. So the things that I'm going to share in the next slide are based on a few um, different uh, projects that we've worked on. One is that we worked with our collaborators in EPFL in Lausanne uh, to develop an um, They actually developed the Embert multilingual model. And they came to us and they said, this model is doing really well for article descriptions. And um, they asked us to test it. We tested, it looks very reasonable. Uh, so the model is now um, alpha released in Android app. If you have an Android app, you can actually test it. It's an article description model. Um, so going through that process of receiving an Embert model in 25 languages and then bringing it to the app, that has taught us some things that I'm gonna talk with you about. Um, the other thing is that we worked over the past year on Wikipedia multilingual reverse risk model. Some of you are aware of this, um, but this, basically this is a more advanced um, or uh, higher performance model compared to the la language agnostic reverse risk model that exists right now. And that is available in 47 languages and bringing that model to 47 languages basically taught us some things. Um, um, we developed a revert risk model for Wikidata. The research portion of this work is done. Development is not done, so uh, this is still waiting. But even the research itself uh, showed us some things. Um, and many of you know we have a link recommendation model in production in the growth dashboard where newcomers learn how to add hyperlinks to already existing articles. That model needed some love um, and um, we made the model more accurate and more performant. The model is now available in almost 300 languages. Um, here are some of the things that we learned. Um, for models that generate open-ended text, which is a lot of the models that we talk about these days around like large language models or generative AI, um, there are not good enough ways to evaluate these models automatically. Uh, the model may look really good on paper, the results may be really good, but once we try to bring it on Wikipedia and actually work, make it work on Wikipedia, then we run into this problem that there are a lot of right answers and then there are a lot of like wrong, what's considered wrong answers but we don't actually have enough good data to be able to automatically um, assess the quality of these models. And this is um, what we are concluding for now is that we are at a place that we still need the human to check the result of these models because sometimes it does amazingly well and sometimes it does miserably bad. Um, and we haven't figured out, you know, we're continuing to improve it, but we haven't really figured it out. Um, Labeling model output for ground truth, uh, just for those of you who ground truth doesn't, may not mean much, uh, for developing a machine learning or AI model, we need to know what is the source of truth. There needs to be a piece of data that we can rely on and we say this one for sure we know is correct. Um, so for example, um, we need to know for sure if an article is deleted or whether a, a re revision is reverted. Um, this kind of ground truth data is very scarce at the moment for us, and this is creating a lot of challenges. One of the challenges, which 
applies also to you all is that when we want to train these models or we, when we want to evaluate these models, we come back to the communities and ask the communities to help with labeling. And this labeling is very expensive. Of course, like your resources are limited, so we are coming back to you with like, we really need your help with more labeling. Uh, to the extent that we have, you know, language experts or, or like people who speak the languages in our team and know Wikipedia enough to be able to do this, we speak more than uh, 10 languages, so we can label ourselves. But then when it goes beyond that, then we need to rely on the communities for doing that. And that's, um, it's a challenge. Um, one where our, one place our head is, is that Many um, of the users with extended rights do a lot of labeling of content already as they're going through their workflows. We just don't have a very good way to bring all these labels back to the systems that we are working with for developing these models. So some of it is really pipeline and infrastructure problem. But it's the problem that is there. If you have contributed to labeling, I thank you sincerely. You are bringing these models to your communities. And I really appreciate that you show up and do the labeling. And please know that we don't ask you um, without thinking. We go through a lot of things before coming to you to ask for help if you want the model to come to your community. And the last thing I want to say is that um, our approach for offering AI models in different languages, um, we're realizing that it needs to be more and more nuanced. Um, there are many models, many different ways we can serve the more than 300 Wikipedia languages and potentially other projects that we can serve. And we cannot go based on the mental model that every model needs to be available in every language in the same way. Um, one of the constraints that my team is working with is that at the, mo at the moment, in production, we can have roughly 300 models. So one of the problems we ran with link recommendation, for example, was that for link recommendation, we had one model per language. So we hit that limit of 300 with just one model. So basically, the infrastructure and machine learning team came back to us and said, OK, you either are going to have one model in production, or you need to figure out how to do this model, link recommendation, without using all the capacity that we have for hosting models. So this is to say that, of course, you know, our infrastructure can expand. We can think about how to work with universities and other places that may have resources. But there is a real cap on infrastructure. Um, and we need to think really collectively, smartly, transparently about what kind of services we offer, AI and ML services we offer when, for what purpose. Um, I'm not too worried about this in some sense. I think we just need to be transparent and have criteria for choosing. Many languages on, the, on Wikipedia don't need all the different models that we have to, today. What they need is perhaps a room to grow and one day have access to those models. We are also thinking about this concept of core functions of um, editing an encyclopedia. And I actually don't have a lot of um, understanding of what I'm saying. But the idea is maybe there are a core set of functions that we need to make sure that we support for writing an encyclopedia. And for those functions, we basically aspire to or do whatever we can to bring those functions to every language that we are supporting. And then there are some additional func functions or capabilities that we just bring to some of the projects until we have more capacity to expand them. Um, there's not much time in this session to talk about these core uh, functionalities. If you have thoughts about it, if you want to talk about it, I'm here for the rest of the day and evening. I would love to hear from you. With that, um, these are the findings. I'm just going to open it up. We have one minute. Um, so I say, let's do two quick questions, or maybe one. Let's do one, actually. Oh, sorry. Adam. Oh, I feel so honored. Um, uh, at, at one point, there was a concept of having something like a feature store. And so uh, uh, for. Uh, just quickly explaining this. This is yeah, something. Uh, this is like the input to a machine learning model, um, but it's features about an article. For example, how many references it has. Uh, if we shared those, maybe it could um, satisfy some of the needs that we have without having to generate an entire model. That's correct, and we currently don't have a feature store, right? So that's uh, part of the challenge. Yes. Um, okay. 
Um, thank you so much for being in this se session. I encourage you to stay in touch with us. Uh, there are a few ways that you can do that. All the members of the research team offer one-on-one -on -one time to talk with you. So if you have a question that you want to talk about, um, please check out those links. There are different people that um, you can reach out to. You can book them. There's a public mailing list, Wikiresearch L, and research.wikimedia.org. And Kinneret, our research community officer, and myself are here for the rest of the day. Happy to talk with you. Thank you so much.